Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Aiden. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking to Haggard Hawks. Paul Anthony Jones is the man behind the brilliant Haggard Hawks Twitter account, filling the online world with odd facts and curious etymologies for about a decade now. He's also the author of numerous books, including the original Haggard Hawks and Pulty Poltroons, The Origin of English in Ten Words, The Cabinet of Linguistic Curiosities, A Yearbook of Forgotten Words, Around the World in Eighty Words, A Journey Through the English Language, and The Cabinet of Calm, Soothing Words for Troubled Times. He joined us to talk about his newest book, Why Is This a Question? Everything About the Origins and Oddities of Language You Never Thought to Ask which has just been released in the UK and will hopefully be available in the US and Canada and around the world soon. This short book is jam-packed with information about the origin of language, why English works the way it does, and how our writing system has developed from its earliest beginnings, among other things. It would make a great Christmas present, as would any of his books. We had an absolutely lovely time talking to Paul, so without further ado, let's go to that interview. Woohoo! So hi, Paul. Thanks so much for being here. <laughs> oh, a pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me back. You have the the great honor of being the very first repeat guest on the show. And I think that's very <laughs> fitting that it's you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's me. Yeah, I've, I'm absolutely not deserving of that at all, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, I think you are one of the guests who is perhaps the most closely aligned with the work that we do in, in your own way. <laughs> Though we've had other people on who do language and etymology and things. I do definitely think we have much in common. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I think you're right. Yeah, definitely. Oh, as if. That's amazing. Oh, well, thank you. I feel, I feel very touched. Well, as I've often said, the real reason we do this podcast is to give us an excuse to talk to people we want to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if we can't use it to talk to a friend that we haven't been able to talk to in a while, then what's the point of having it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If that's a good enough excuse as any, I'm sure. <laughs> so what we'll do, though, to be formal and proper before we just get into just chatting mm. is <laughs> start off by asking you the question we these days ask all of our guests. So, Mark. So. Or are there any unexpected connections in your life, in your work, in your relating to your current book or anything like that, that you would like to talk to us about? You know, that's since I knew that I was going to have to talk about connections, I, I've sat here and come up with about 10. And <laughs> now I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of thinking which one to narrow it down to. Because I used to, one of the weird ones, actually, I don't know if this counts, but I used to be a piano teacher years ago mm. and yeah the I, i've gone completely off piste already where are we like two minutes in uh, but yeah <laughs> i used to be <laughs> used to be a piano teacher and this was kind of back when i was very very first starting writing and the number of overlaps between music and language was insane they always kind of struck me and my teacher as it was a brilliant musician around here called Kevin who runs the big music school in Newcastle he was kind of fascinated by this because it had never kind of struck him before so both me and him kind of connected he's a superb musician and I kind of just finished my master's in linguistics so we'd sit in my lessons and talk for an hour about how language has phrasing and music has phrasing <laughs> and it all <laughs> has a natural pulse and a natural rhythm that sounds right and it sounds wrong sometimes so that yeah that that's one that kind of has just sprung to mind but yeah kind of career-wise as well the the way that I've always kind of worked with writing books is that quite often something will crop up in the research for one that will give me the idea for the next one probably not the best <laughs> probably not the best or most organized way of writing to be honest but yeah it's always been there's always so there's always been like a little connection between each book and between kind of each project I guess this one had a long connection to a blog that I wrote I think like 2014 2015 something like that that kind of gave me the idea for that and now it's cropped up in this book even the books before this one though I remember I was writing the yearbook the cabinet which was like about three four years ago and one of the words I wanted to include in that is Stellenbosch which mm. I love 
which is to sort of tactically demote somebody is to Stellenbosch them. So you sort of <laughs> give them a job that they can't complain about because it's still a really high status job, but it's it's not one that has an awful lot of an, an awful lot of impact. So it's sort of like mm-hmm. a backroom kind of position. And it comes from the Boer War when people whose military tactics hadn't worked out on the front line would be sent to the Stellenbosch remount camp to look after the horses, which was a really <laughs> important job. But it wasn't. It wasn't frontline. Not a decision anymore. making one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I loved this story, and I loved this word, and there wasn't room to put it in the cabinet, so I, I kept hold of it, and that ended up giving me the idea for the Around the World book, which was all about word origins that come from place names. So right. yeah, there's there's always been these little kind of threads that run between kind of probably everything that I do. I'm always mm-hmm. kind of looking at something, and then. I'll spot something that I can use somewhere else. <laughs> it's probably, <laughs> probably it just proves how kind of butterfly minded I am, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, I imagine your your research often goes along the lines of just sort of casting about generally mm. and finding little cool surprise things that you weren't really looking for, but they're really cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how it is. And what's, what's nice about running the Twitter account as well is that I remember when I was doing the research for this book, I, I stumbled across the the thing from Malagasy where all the demonstrative pronouns are, are ordered by distance oh, as yes. well as, so you can, I think there's seven layers of distance in it, like kind of baked into the language. And I thought this was really interesting. So we're halfway through kind of researching that chapter. I thought, oh, I'll put this on Twitter. And it took about half an hour to write <laughs> to write it up and get it to fit into what about 200 characters or something but yeah. i'd kind of just randomly stumbled across it and put it up on twitter and, and that that kind of became the acid test for you know is this as interesting as, as i think it is <laughs> if people kind of react to it on twitter then yeah then it kind of works and it stays in the final draft right <laughs> so you have a, an immediate beta reader as it were <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so if i just sort of stumble across something that i think is interesting i can kind of put it out there and hopefully right. find, hopefully other people think the same i imagine with the kinds of topics that you talk about in this book it is a lot harder to get them into tweets than say a word right you can talk yeah. about a surprising word in a relatively short amount of space but yeah, you know, talking about a linguistic concept must be harder. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. One of the things that I mean, it did kind of, Twitter did kind of become my acid test for this, and I remember writing one of the chapters is kind of roughly about pragmatics, and I wanted mm-hmm. to write about scalar implicature, and I thought, is this interesting? And so I put it up on Twitter, thinking, you know, I'd, I'll explain this and put it out and see if people enjoy it. And it took genuinely, it took about forty minutes to condense it into. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 240 characters or something mm-hmm. in a way that kind of still explained it well hopefully explained it in an accurate way but also kind of made it relate to <laughs> relate to the real world so yeah right. it's a bit of a double-edged sword sometimes it's yeah I think this is a really interesting topic now how can I get that into one tweet <laughs> <laughs> okay let's talk about the book then there's some other things that we'll come back to but since we're onto it this is a different book than mm. what you've written so far. And not completely, obviously, but mm. many of your previous books have been a little more based around a list, really, essentially, yeah. or, or yeah. you know, a collection of thematically related words, or as you said, yeah. there are words around, you know, place names around the world or whatever, or here's a bunch of really cool little, essentially standalone facts. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. This one, although perhaps because you are used to that it is sort of organized in its table of contents as if it's a list it really isn't no it's more (laughs) well rather than me telling you what your book is about why don't you you tell us a little bit about sort of how it's organized and how you conceived of it as a book yeah i kind of had the idea well like i said before i've kind of had this idea to write a book like this for about seven or eight years Mm-hmm. The book, I should say, is 20 chapters that are questions about language that hopefully you never thought to ask or have never come across the answer to almost. So it's right. things like, why is the alphabet in the order that it's in? And why do we put our words in the order that they go on? And why do some languages have gender? And what are words mm-hmm. and languages at all? And all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I, I kind of had this idea of this would be a cool book to write and answer some of these questions. Because some of them that I, I kind of was coming up with in my mind, I 
didn't know the answer myself. I, I've got no idea why the alphabet's in the order that it's in. <laughs> I had no idea at all. So yeah, I thought, yeah, that'd be a cool book to write. And it kind of stored it away for about six or seven years because I knew that it would be a big, big project. And it, and it mm-hmm. really, really was. So I kind of, when I first thought of it, I kind of almost felt like I wasn't ready to write it. I kind of needed Mm -hmm. to convince myself that I could actually write (laughs) in in a way that was sort of cohesive and works and that I wasn't going to make an absolute hash of it. So, yeah, I kind of feel like I've sort of been orbiting this idea for a little while and working on working on other books that are, like you say, they they are kind of based more around, I guess, the kind of Twittery approach. It's it's kind of lots Mm -hmm. and lots of individual stories or individual etymologies or whatever. This is the first kind of longer form stuff that I've that I've written, I guess. But yeah, it, it was it was that thing of like I needed to convince myself that I could do it, and because <laughs> I knew it was going to be massive. I told my publishers originally that when I pitched it to them that it would take about six months to write, and it <laughs> took I think I think it took two and a half years. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> slightly underestimated the amount of work involved <laughs> and the amount of research that it would need <laughs> to bring it together. Yeah, it was kind of down to the wire. I think I was contracted January of this year and I think I submitted it in July. Right. Yeah, so it's a little bit, a little bit off schedule. I mean, as an academic, that seems like a completely sensible... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's on time. <laughs> See, it's in my blood. It's in my blood. <laughs> so yeah, it was a much bigger project than I thought it was going to be. I mean, I always kind of knew it was going to be a big project, but there was just so much stuff that I needed to triple check, and I wanted mm-hmm. to. It's it's a hard way to write as well, I think, because. I've said this before in interviews that I, th- I think it's as hard, if not actually a little bit harder to write for a general audience than it is to write for a kind of closed or academic audience. Because if you write a paper or a thesis or something, you are writing for people whose knowledge of a subject you can kind of second guess. You kind of enter on their level and they're either going to be on your level or above it. And if they don't understand some of the terms or the models or studies or whatever that you're referring to, then it kind of behooves them and them alone to go and read up on it and come back to your Mm -hmm. work to understand it. If I was doing that in a book like this, that's, yes, it's going to hopefully appeal to kind of people who have a background in language and who are interested in it, but hopefully it's also appealing to people who just have a kind of armchair interest in it and who Mm -hmm. have never studied linguistics, but just find language interesting if I suddenly kind of start dropping things like Proto-Indo-European and speech act theory and the cooperative principle, if I, if I suddenly start talking about these things as if, you know, everyone <laughs> everyone knows what they are, you're mm-hmm. instantly kind of alienating people. But at the same time, there is going to be a lot of people who do know what that stuff is. So you kind of, you have to walk this line of hopefully not massively talking down to people who do get it and not talking massively over the heads of people who don't. It's sort of, you're walking this very, very thin tightrope the entire time. And yeah, so every kind of sentence in this had to be, had to strike that balance, which made it like academically, it was difficult to kind of research it and hopefully bring it all together in a way that made sense. But then having to kind of package it in that way was, was probably just as hard as sort of 80,000 mm-hmm. words needed to kind of walk, <laughs> needed to walk that <laughs> tightrope between those two, two audiences. So yeah, I can only hope that I've got it right, I guess. And I imagine that's the reason that you did it as a series of questions, because, you know, Mm. if you titled a chapter Proto-Indo-European, that's going to kind of turn people off pretty quickly if they don't know, (laughs) you know, what the title of the chapter means. But if you state it as a question, it sort of invites them in a bit more. Yeah. And I think I was going to go for many more shorter chapters at first. I think I kind of had the contest was originally like about 40 or 50 different chapters that were individual questions that were going to be much more back and forth it would be a bit more punchy but Mm. it it kind of became quite obvious quite early on that there's so much overlap you kind of can't explain what's a good example like one of the chapters is about why the letter i has a dot over it and you kind of you can't explain that without explaining why we have upper and lowercase letters at all and you can't explain that without explaining why we use the alphabet that we do and you can't explain that without explaining 
what an alphabet itself actually is and you can't explain that without explaining <laughs> how how writing works and how we you can kind of begin to understand what's written down on a page so the, so the closer you look at it you the more stuff you, that, that needs to kind of all go into the same section so yeah that that original kind of long form lots and lots of short chapters but in a much much broader list of chapters that quickly was reshuffled into a smaller section but hopefully mm. Hopefully the question and answer thing still works in this format. Well, that's so that's sort of what I meant by saying that while it's theoretically organized into a list, I mean, a list of questions, but into these discrete pieces, Mm. it strikes me on reading it all that what it please I don't want to make this sound like it's going to put anyone off of it because this is not (laughs) what it is, but it it in, essentially becomes an introductory textbook. I'm so, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, I, I met up with Danny Bates a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. and he said that it's almost like a primer in linguistics, which is exactly yeah. what I was kind of. I know that each chapter is sort of a question, but behind the scenes, there's the, a continuity. The, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's sort of like, yes, I'm answering a funny question that hopefully you've never thought to ask, but I'm secretly telling you what. Paralinguistics is sorry. Right. Kind of, yeah, behind the scenes, yeah. I'm technically introducing you to the concept of pragmatics. <laughs> it's that yeah, kind of thing. well, and and not only that, but also what you were saying about how the you know the chapters do they rely while you can read each individual chapter on its own. I don't think that they rely on each other completely. Nonetheless, one builds on the knowledge of another, or you cross reference them, or whatever, such yeah. in such a way that what you're doing, I think, with the whole book is sort of taking us from we don't have language to we are modern human beings interacting with written texts yeah and understanding some certainly not all of the neurological reasons why we do so and that the story in the whole book you know you go at it from different directions as you go along but kind of Mm. takes you that journey um, mm-hmm. And that's the way in which I sort of think it's an introductory textbook, not just to linguistics, but to what is language. Yeah. I, I, I know yeah. it's only one of your chapters, but really is the whole thing. It kind of technically is. <laughs> it's the whole yeah. thing, yeah. <laughs> kind of secretly, it's just one long question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I mean, I, I found that, like, I found it very effective. I found it really good. And I think you do walk that line of being clear but also being really quite highly technical in some Mm. sections Mm. and like in a way that's not i don't think off-putting or hard to understand i mean obviously it's a little hard for me to be the naive reader Um, yeah you know that's the difficulty every expert faces when they write for non-experts is yeah it's really hard to put on the non-expert hat again (laughs) I know. See, this is the irony of me talking about how hard, how hard this was. Right, I'm talking to you two, or like, the, like the experts in your field. It's amazing. Well, I mean, but it's it, but it's the same. I mean, we both struggle with that all the time. And mm-hmm. I absolutely, you know, I've recently taken on a few projects that involve taking stuff I know really intimately at an academic level and writing it for sometimes for an academic audience, but one that's non-specialized, which, which is its yeah. own kind of weirdness yeah. where you're, you can expect them to be familiar with academic argumentation and style, but not any of the content. <laughs> and that was interesting. <laughs> and then also writing for a more general interested, you know, interested and thoughtful public that doesn't know any of the details. And yeah, I, I definitely find it a challenge that is a very, distinct i don't know if it's harder than writing academic writing but i've done a lot more of the academic writing so it's sort yeah. of what i'm much less practiced at whereas you are used to writing for a general public at least yeah i, I, I think it took me a long time to kind of get the voice right as well for doing that mm. i think i think a lot of that came actually out of blogging i think that really helped i think because especially some of my first books and even probably some of the first blogs were still kind of written in a sort of academic ease almost there was they were mm-hmm. kind of quite formal still whereas I think hopefully now I, I guess it's kind of communicating it more than it's just getting it in a way that yeah it's accessible I guess mm-hmm. that's the kind of angle that I want to go at but it's hard <laughs> it's really really hard <laughs> so you've talked about you know the fact that you had this idea what is it mm. like eight years ago now? Yeah. Why now? Why why did why did, was now the moment that you decided to finally take take on the topic? 
that's or two and a half or three years ago. No, why, why, why then? <laughs> why then? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's a really good question. Yeah, part, partly it was, like I say, partly it was kind of a confidence thing that I thought that I was good enough, a writer now, to, to tackle it and to try and take it on. And I haven't said that even then. I, I wrote, the, the there's a chapter in there about why we move our hands when we talk. It's, mm -hmm. ironically it's the last chapter in the book but it was the first chapter that I wrote because I knew nothing about that <laughs> I was, I, that was a topic I had never ever researched it was something I had no experience of so I thought right I'll get this one out of the way and it was I actually wrote that before I'd pitched the book because that was kind of my sort of acid test I thought right if I can write this chapter and make this vaguely interesting <laughs> and hopefully <laughs> comprehensive and explain it in a way then yeah I can I can kind of tackle all the rest so I, I wrote that I think I mean even that one chapter on its own took about four or five months to get right and yeah so I, I wrote that and that kind of gave me the boost to go actually you know what I, I can tackle this now I can't I can do this one now so that was the kind of professional side of it but also two and a half years ago lockdown happened <laughs> yeah. and suddenly yeah I, I wasn't contracted to do anything for the first time in a while and I suddenly had all of this time and nothing to really fill it with so I thought well if I don't write this now when am I going to do it <laughs> so yeah that, it was the free time that gave me that yeah that suddenly gave me the, the space in my timetable to go actually you know what I can take on a bigger project that's going to have me reading books and papers for the first time in a long time. Yeah, so, the, so it was a combination of me knowing that I was, it sounds a bit big-headed, but knowing that I was good enough to, to write it, and also the time constraints, they, they kind of loosened off during lockdown. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I suddenly had the kind of time to be able to really take deep dives into subjects and fields that I, I wasn't before this, all that experienced in personally. Yeah, that raises the uh, question I was going to ask is, I do remember our last conversation, we talked about how do you mm. do your research, and you basically said, I read dictionaries, and <laughs> I read weird dictionaries, and I read, yeah. you know, it, it's a sort of a magpie approach to some extent. And yeah. I imagine that the research task was, and you've alluded to this, rather different for this book. Uh, yeah. Not only are you going into the linguistic stuff, which you do you know, you have studied and do have knowledge of and presumably had some idea of where to go to find, you know, where has the field got to on these subjects. Yeah. But you've also got stuff in there about brain scans and about, mm. as you were talking about, the gestures and you've got stuff yeah. about, uh, there were a couple of things I'm trying to remember, the particulars where I was thinking, there is no way you had any <laughs> idea about any of this before you started. <laughs> Some of the stuff most... about the physical body and yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, the way um... the vocal folds work and you know some of that. Oh stuff. yeah, the, the Bernoulli effect that that was that was yeah. new to me. <laughs> exactly. No, yeah, uh, this is uh, very very true. Yeah, because it, it was really not my. I mean, even when even when I was kind of studying at uni and, and doing my masters and things, I was still studying mainly historical stuff. So I, I was doing mm -hmm. toponymy. So I was I was doing place name studies in, in the north of England, that was my kind of main thing. So I was still right. dealing with old documents and old mm -hmm. maps and old dictionaries and all sorts of things. I was kind of right at the back of the library and the archives. And suddenly with this book, you know, I, I'm having to talk about the elasticity of vocal folds and things yes. like that. I, <laughs> I'm not, I am not a scientist <laughs> in any way, shape or form. So that took a long, long time to make sure it was accurate and made mm -hmm. sense. I almost was like, if I can understand it, then anyone can, because this is not, <laughs> this is not my field at all. A really good friend of mine, Matt, who lives up in, in Edinburgh, I've known him for decades and decades. We've known each other since we were three and we could not be more different. I've, I've gone down the full humanities route and he's gone mm -hmm. full science and he's now a biochemistry, a doctor of biochemistry of Edinburgh Uni. And I was emailing him back and forward going, hey, just explain this to me. <laughs> I said, I do not understand this. I actually sent him that, that very first chapter before it went to my publishers, I sent him that because there was a study in there that postulates that one of the reasons why we move our hands is because our primordial ancestors would have had the same bundle of nerves in their hindbrain that that would have allowed them to signal with gills and fins and i was reading mm -hmm. this and i was like this is amazing i want the, i want to put this in the book 
And I wrote it up and sent it off to him, and he was like, "No, this this makes no sense. This is not <laughs> this is not what this paper <laughs> says. You know, you know, you can't say this." And like, I basically was like, you know, I might as well just have called them like flappers rather than fins. It was just, I was way <laughs> I was way off kilter. Uh, so yeah, he reined me back in. He gets he gets a shout out in the acknowledgements for sorting my science out whenever it comes up. But yeah, I mean, that was like a, a lot of the questions that I wanted to answer. I kind of wanted to know the answer myself. Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it was just so outside of my comfort zone to sort of talk about the physiology of speech and like how the brain stores language and things it's sort of not my uh, not my wheelhouse really so it was challenging I was amazed kind of how rusty I was at at reading academic papers and looking Mm -hmm. at models and interpreting them Mm -hmm. because because like you say my way of writing about language has always been this is an interesting word let me tell you about how it's connected to Latin and Greek or or the Germanic tree or whatever it might be. And that's been my shtick for a long time. So to walk outside of that and st- suddenly start talking about some quite high level stuff was, yeah, I had to make sure I was, <laughs> I had to make sure I was kind of on my toes with it, definitely. In a way, I think it, it it's an advantage to, to have a general knowledge, but not the very specific knowledge because it makes you think, well, how, how would I understand that? How, how can I explain yeah. this to myself? Mm-hmm. Then you're already halfway there to explaining it to your readers. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it helps you with that expertise problem mm-hmm. because in fact, you're not an expert in those specialized yeah. elements anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess you become your own audience in that respect. It's kind of like, mm-hmm. if you can get it down to a, to a level where you can understand it, then that's the level that you need to pitch it at. So yeah, some of those technical chapters. Yeah, I read them back now. This is the first book that I'm really kind of proud of. Well, that sounds bad, but <laughs> I, think, I, I think a lot of writers will tell you the same thing that because you need to be really self-critical, I guess, because mm-hmm. you need to, I mean, I'm sure you, you'll do the same with your work as well, that you, you'll read it and redraft it and redraft it and redraft it because you notice this bit doesn't work or this bit needs to go before this bit or this bit Mm -hmm. needs to come out and this bit needs to be explained differently so you're constantly looking at what you've done really critically and it's difficult to turn that off even when it goes to print and you're sat there (laughs) holding a hard copy of it and it's in a shop it's difficult (laughs) to stop going oh actually you know I think I was maybe closer in an earlier draft with this section or uh, maybe I should have mm-hmm. put this chapter before this one or what, whatever it might be. It's really difficult to stop doing that even when it's finished. Mm. But this is the first book that I've, I'm kind of reading through, especially those sciencey chapters. And I'm like, this is, this is really good. <laughs> I'm, kind of like, <laughs> I'm really proud of this. I didn't think I'd ever be able to explain this sort of stuff. And, and there it is. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's been a challenge and it's taken me out of my comfort zone, definitely. But yeah, I'm really, really happy with it. Well, I think you should be. I agree. Mm-hmm. I think it's, well, you know, far be it for me to be the person who's in a position to make this kind of judgment, but I think it's well written and clear and engaging. And oh, that means a lot. it's that engaging really does without. Mean a lot. <laughs> no, I really do think so. And I think it's interesting because you frame it with these questions and you have a conversational tone and you make, you know, mild jokes along the way in a pleasant Mm. and charming way and it's all great but it's not as i don't know how to say this in a way that doesn't it's not as flippant as it maybe could be which is good so let me be clear here yeah (laughs) but i I think that it's it's engaging without being please do not take this the wrong way without being entertaining i don't think it's a book about you know, that that's sort of making language entertaining, which is fine. And I have no problem with that. And making language entertaining is something, you know, many of us try to do a lot of the time. (laughs) And that's fine. I think this book maybe sits in a slightly different place where it Mm. is engaging because it's making you think and it's thoughtful. And it sounds like you're having a conversation with your clever friend down the pub rather (laughs) than doing a sort of game show about isn't this funny with a comedian. Oh, that's if you see good. what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. You you bring out the what's interesting about the topic without having to do, yeah, a lot of kind of window dressing around yeah. it to sort of yeah. make it sound that's more good. interesting than it is. You do a good yeah. job of kind of really showing why it, the thing actually is very interesting. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way of tr- what I was trying to, to say. And and please, like those those listening who maybe have different kinds of books. That's not a criticism of different ways of doing it. Yeah. I just thought it was something that struck me as I was reading that it is engaging, but it's a different kind of engaging than some popularizing yeah. approaches out there. Yeah, that's good. No, I, that's, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you said that as well. <laughs> it's, like, it's really good. 
<laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, you know, that's a really good point because I remember when I first started writing about language, Haggard Hawks came out just after Mark Forsyth's Etymologicon, which yeah. was massively popular all over the world. And he has that very kind of, he's still obviously really accurate and he still gets the facts across, but he is almost like a kind of comic writer. He's very wryly witty mm-hmm. alongside everything. Mm-hmm. And a lot of publishers, I think, wanted that mark two out of me. And I kind of mm. was always, no, I'd rather make the information interesting on its own and let it speak for itself almost. Like in, yeah, hopefully, mm-hmm. hopefully that's what this book's pitched at. It's not kind of, like you say, yeah, not flippant. That's not to say that Mark's work's flippant. It's no, just, it's flippant's not quite style. the right word, but it's not, yeah, it's, it's just pitched differently. I'm thinking a little bit, of you know the greg jenner podcast Mm. you're dead to me which is very good it's a podcast about history and he has a historian and a comedian on and they talk and it's good well-researched history and they talk about really interesting things but it is framed as a comedian and a historian and you know this is going to be a comic approach to historical topics i like it very much i enjoy it very much and it does a really good job of getting the history across within that framework Mm. But it's a particular kind of framework that says you're you're coming at this for entertainment and you'll learn some stuff along the way. Yeah. And that's yeah. fine and, and sensible, but I don't think that's what this particular book does. And mm. I like that about it. So good. Yeah. I'm that's, sort of groping for I, how to categorize it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think because I think that's my kind of yeah, that's my sort of style of writing, I think, is not overtly let's make this funny and yeah, I'm gonna tell you some stuff along the way. It's more the stuff on its own is interesting enough. So I'm going to kind of package it in a way that's hopefully. I'm going to pull out and highlight the parts that are interesting and exciting yeah. Yeah. in themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you do a good job of that. Good. Oh, thank and you. The other thing I want to say, just so it's you know clear, I mean, yes, it's, it's certainly very accessible to, you know, a lay audience, but for those potential readers out there who do know more about language and linguistics, mm just uh, given the breadth of stuff that you cover Mm -hmm. there's a lot in there that i didn't know about or i sort of vaguely Mm. had an idea about this but that it you know existed but Mm -hmm. never really properly learned anything about it before yeah so there is a lot in there to interest i think all levels of of readers oh that's good that's good yeah because that that's that's always my worries i'm kind of Especially as when Haggard Hawks first started, the first people who followed it really were, were probably people like yourself. It was fellow language bloggers and language writers who work, a, a large part of their work is online. And they were kind of the first people to discover it organically because you find stuff on Twitter and then they share mm-hmm. it to their audience. So that first, I don't know, that first 500,000 followers on Twitter or something was was a lot of other writers and other people from the same field. And then when it started to get picked up from like BuzzFeed and, <laughs> and the Huffing <laughs> Post and stuff, suddenly this great waft of people who don't have that kind of background, but have the same kind of interest came in as well. So that's what's made me walk this line between the two, mm-hmm. the two audiences, I guess. So yeah, I, I'm glad that, I'm glad that you said that, 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 that it's not, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't sort of talk down to you if you've already got some background mm-hmm. in this. I did mm-hmm. want to kind of, I, I had it kind of weirdly had it in my head that I wanted there to be something on every double page that even if you knew the topic maybe Mm. it would be explained in a way that you maybe hadn't heard before or that there would be a case study or an example that you've Mm. maybe not come across before so I always try to hopefully pick like I remember doing writing this section that's on the dialect continuum and the classic example of that is always the romance languages and how they're all related to each other and I wrote up this big section about how you can start in Sicily and move up through all the regions of Italy and then you can go across southern France and you'll hear all these things and on a map it's different countries that have different languages but on the ground it's one long kind of chain that just blends into Mm -hmm. each other and I wrote this big section up based around the Mediterranean and then I thought no that's the example that everyone bloody uses so I was thinking (laughs) I binned the whole thing and I was like no I'm going to write a different dialect continuum and I I ended up doing the Turkey one out out into Russia from the Black Sea and Mm -hmm. that was so much more interesting for me and I thought yeah hopefully that's an example that maybe doesn't get isn't in that intro textbook that everyone else has read yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so I, that, that was always in the back of my mind is that, that it, even if you do know this material, hopefully it's explained in a way or there's something alongside it that takes it outside of something you're already familiar with. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you succeeded. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. I was so nervous, so nervous about this book, honestly. So yeah, anything, like, any good feedback, I'll, I'll definitely take it. <laughs> <laughs> so. The 
that brings me just moving away from the book a little bit, though, I suspect mm. it'll come back to it. So the last time we spoke was October of 2016. Uh, not the last time we spoke, but the last time we interviewed you. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, which that's, is, that's mad. Feels like essentially decades ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Realize it's not quite 10 years, but I mean, it's a fair number. Yeah. Uh, but so since 2016, then... Mm. <laughs> this is a rather large question. <laughs> that decades ago time. How's, how's things gone? How's things changed? What's been going on? <laughs> and uh, I realize that's a rather big question. But, you know, when we spoke to you, you'd been doing Haggard Hawks for a while. You'd had a couple books out. But yeah. I feel like the social media landscape, blogs, maybe even interest in language and linguistics have... Uh, the world has changed fairly substantially since 2016. Yeah. And I don't know if you can cast your mind back there to even remember what it was like then, but mm. are there, are there trends or differences Are how are you finding sort of making a career in this field going yeah. in this last while? That's a really good question. Yeah. I, I'm thinking like 2016 because 2016 was the Brexit year over here. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. It um, just happened that summer. Yeah. Yeah. It, that kind of feels like a bit of a tide mark. Mm -hmm. Everything before then, like there was the 2012 London Olympics, which was like super and open and vibrant. And then mm -hmm. kind of Brexit happened and it was just, everything's just been a little bit sour ever since then. And I think mm -hmm. especially being predominantly on social media you're at the sort of cool face of that a lot of the time it's mm -hmm. it, people have suddenly started taking yeah taking a lot of that out on social media which is yeah. I mean, it's understandable so yeah i think my personal twitter account hasn't really changed because i've just i'm not interested in arguing with people on that but because i like to subtweet the news on haggard hopes <laughs> that's all sort of 2016 then the sort of downward slope from then threw me into some of those conversations sometimes and i think as well I, weirdly i i've had this conversation with people before that i think during lockdown i don't know whether it was the effect of lockdown and how everyone was suddenly really stressed and a bit anxious and you know, it was a horrible experience that everyone went through. Or whether it was the fact that the account Haggard Hawks got so big at that point. Mm. It just like the replies and things just became a little <laughs> bit snide some, sometimes. And I was just like, no, I'm not really interested in that anymore. I don't really read the replies on there anymore. Whereas I, mm -hmm. one of the early days of Haggard Hawks, I used to love getting into conversations with people about it. And if someone asked a question, I would go and research it and come back to them and explain it and all the rest of it. I love that kind of back and forth of it now and now I kind of don't <laughs> I kind of just, I just leave it to run in the background and hope it sort of looks after itself so yeah and in terms of like the social media landscape I think that's changed a lot in those mm -hmm. what six years it feels mm -hmm. like maybe things that well I, I, I was gonna say politically things sort of feel like they're maybe starting to turn a page a little bit but then again you know just the last couple of weeks Twitter's they had a new <laughs> wave of things happening Hanks to it. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> new existential <laughs> threat. <laughs> yeah, which is lovely. <laughs> yeah, so that's another. We'll weather that. Have you so tried I'm out not... Mastodon yet? <laughs> I, you know, I, one of my mates texted me and he was like, have you joined Mastodon yet? And I was like, no, not yet. And he went, well, I'm going to steal Haggard Hawks. I was like, right, I'm getting on this straight away. <laughs> so I've, yeah, I've yeah, pitched exactly. the tent, but I'm, yeah, I'm not in it yet. So I've got, I've got Haggard Hawks after Mastodon, whatever it is, just, just mm. in case. This thing's like, objectively, it's hilarious, but kind of personally, I'm really sad about it because I really, I really mm -hmm. do love Twitter. I, I think it's great. And my, mm -hmm. and my personal feed, I follow loads of photographers and loads of comedy writers and loads of art history accounts and stuff that, that I just love having a look at every day I absolutely love it and professionally as well there is something I think actually this is probably another one of these things that's changed maybe in the last sort of six years Twitter kind of democratizes writing I guess in a way mm -hmm. especially over here I think in the last few years publishing has become very much like it's not the quality of your work, it's who you are. And so you, you look at, the, I was going to say the top 20 books on Amazon, you look at the top 100 books on Amazon in the UK, and they'll all be from people who are already well established as something else before they got a book deal. So it'll be right. TV right. chefs, or it'll be TV presenters who are now writing children's books or novels or something. And publishing has gone down that route, because that's a really easy way to make lots and lots of money, which for someone like 
me who didn't go to the right school, <laughs> didn't go to the right <laughs> uni, and I'm not kind of Oxford or Cambridge, and I don't live in London, and I don't talk the right way, and I don't, I don't like can't just you know drop in on meetings and things down in the home counties or whatever. I turned up in publishing without any contacts or anything. And it's mm-hmm. now the, it's so, so contact based now that what's nice about Twitter is that that kind of gives me something to bring to the table. So it mm-hmm. democratized that a little bit. You can go, yes, I don't have any contacts to call on and I don't have the right education and I didn't go to the right private school. I went to some bog standard, <laughs> like state <laughs> comprehensive in Tyneside <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> you know, it's like after the Thatcher government, it wasn't, you know, the most affluent place in the world. And so, yeah, I can't kind of bring anything. I, well, I couldn't bring anything to the table when I first started, whereas Twitter was my in. I say, yes, mm-hmm. I don't have that, but I have this. So if that goes pop, I'm not lucky in a way that I've got the blog and the website and everything. That's all set up now. Whereas mm-hmm. if this had happened around about that kind of 2016 time, I, I don't think I'd have probably ended up having the career that I have just because publishing has gone down a very different road, I guess, in, in this country. Yeah. So the, I, yeah, that's another kind of change I think that's happened kind of industry-wide, I guess, as as a writer over the last few years. It's, it's becoming harder and harder for untried writers over here mm-hmm. to break through which is one of the reasons yeah. why i like helping if people ask or email me about getting into this i, I love it i absolutely love it because yeah it doesn't happen enough that people get chances and get contacts and things now so yeah mm-hmm. it's it, it's becoming it's becoming trickier definitely yeah i think there's a next i think it's i mean i can't speak to the north american publishing scene maybe with quite the same knowledge but i think in general everywhere it's about coming with a ready-made audience. That's what yeah, they need. And definitely. if you don't have a ready-made audience and a a fairly clear way that you're going to use that audience to, you know, convince that audience to buy your book, then yeah. they don't have the publishers don't do the promotion anymore. Yeah. Is what I mostly hear. If yeah. you, if there's you have to be the promoter and oh definitely that's definitely if they don't think you're going to be able to do that promotion then it doesn't matter what the content of the book is yeah and i mean i've certainly that's never not been true to some extent but mm. i think it's the balance shifting yeah definitely yeah. i mean i in a way i kind of understand it because publishing again it's this kind of six seven year thing that a publishing was sort of at the tail end of that like DVDs were wiped out by streaming mm-hmm. and CDs were wiped out by Spotify and MP3s mm-hmm. and iPods and all that. And there was a real kind of panic that bookshops and traditional publishing was going to get wiped out by Kindles and e-readers. So I kind of understand why for a time publishing went down that what's the easiest way to make a cheap book <laughs> kind of route. Oh, it's right. to, you know, get stories written by celebrities because they have mm-hmm. a million Twitter followers or whatever. I kind of understand why they did that to weather that storm. But now, I mean, publishing just had the best, most profitable year for 10 years this year. So it's like, well, you've weathered Maybe they that could start storm. taking chances yeah, again. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, it's sort of, but they're not. They're kind of still playing it very safe. And it's, it's, and it's difficult as well because it, if, I mean, it's the nature of the beast, but if you give a, a book contract to a very, very famous person, all of the newspapers are going to want to interview that person and review that book. And Mm -hmm. all the radio stations are going to want that person on and all the book festivals are going to want that person there. And that's Mm -hmm. taken a slot of a lot of untried authors who are maybe publishing their first book and just want one little opportunity to just get into a different realm. And the more famous faces that are being elevated into a, a different industry alongside one that they're already in, it kind of overshadows everyone else. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's becoming tricky. It's definitely becoming tricky. But I mean, that's the reason why I set Haggard Hooks up in the first place was that nobody cared. <laughs> nobody <laughs> cared if I was. And yeah, I, I mean, the book Haggard Hooks came out and it wasn't reviewed anywhere and it wasn't even in my local shop because <laughs> nobody <laughs> knew who I was or what I was doing. And mm-hmm. I, I had a conversation with my agent and he was like, well, you know, you have to sometimes do a lot of this stuff yourself. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. Now I'm just sort of sat at home waiting for the royalty checks to turn up. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was that was kind of the reason almost why I set it up was was because no one was interested. Having said that, this book that's just come out, I mean, I'm a lot further down the road now. This book hasn't had any press at all. Mm. It's not, not been reviewed in any newspapers. So it's really it's 
become quite difficult to even for i mean i'm much you're more a fairly established author at yeah. this point yeah yeah it's yeah it's difficult to even at this stage to get your foot in the door sometimes but that you know maybe maybe things will change and, and publishing will start taking a few more chances in in the next few years once it sort of shakes off that idea that it doesn't have to fight so hard yeah Mm. hopefully hopefully anyway well we'll do our best to reach our vast (laughs) vast audience with their immense amount of disposable wealth (laughs) that's another issue as well no one's got any money at the minute (laughs) yes that that is an ongoing concern i would say for many people in the world but um but you know i can't imagine put it this way i think that your book could function as an intro textbook, but not at the price that a textbook normally costs. <laughs> I don't know exactly what price it's selling for, but I can confidently state that it will be less than a university textbook would cost. Yeah, that's true. Actually, yeah. I, I had to buy a couple of old textbooks to do the research for this. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at them online, and it's like £45 and stuff. And I'm like, what? Yeah. I'll, I'll go around the local secondhand shop and see if they've got, <laughs> see if they've got a copy in. Yeah, it's yeah. pricey. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So think of this, everyone, as your opportunity to get that level of information <laughs> at a different price point. <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah, we should put that on the cover. <laughs> University content for bargain basement prices. <laughs> I don't know if it's bargain basement, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Put that on the dust jacket in quotes. I like it. So you you mentioned that you get more snide comments and things back these days. Mm. In what other ways do you think the audience has changed? Are they more aware or less aware of, you know, language and linguistic kind of stuff? Yeah. Are they misinformed about stuff more now or or um, it's the t- that sort of degree of peevery? <laughs> Yeah, um, that's changed true. at all, would you say? <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you what, one thing that has changed, I remember, weirdly, I remember back when I first started, the word that springs to mind instantly is snollygoster, which oh, yeah. mm-hmm. was six, seven years ago. I mean, it's 10 years ago now since I set up Hagger Courts. Now. That was an odd term that no one really knew. And now right. you'll see that in the press. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be in a newspaper, and it's. I mean, I can't. I'm not saying that I deserve all the credit for pulling that word out of obscurity. I absolutely don't. But it mm-hmm. it almost feels that sort of maybe it's the social media thing. Maybe that it, that there's been a sort of wealth of language books, and there's a lot more mm-hmm. bloggers and a lot more language writers and things, and and a, a podcast like yours, like there is m- many more kind of avenues now to get mm-hmm. to get information out. So it almost feels like things that were quite obscure 10 years ago now maybe aren't so obscure it's almost like mm. it's like what you're saying before that kind of level of the kind of layman interest is almost sort of higher <laughs> in some mm. respects mm-hmm. because sort of there's floor. just yeah yeah it's like it, and maybe that is the social media thing that you know if you're on your commute now if you've got an iphone you you can go on twitter and learn stuff mm-hmm. or go on a blog and learn stuff whereas before you would you know maybe sit and read a paper or read a novel or something suddenly you've got all the world at your fingertips and you can fill up your social media feeds with whatever knowledge you want so there's this maybe drip feed of knowledge mm-hmm. just raised the bar a little bit almost so yeah th- there's been a shift definitely in that direction i think that people are generally more attuned to stuff what's annoying a little bit is one of the things that i've always tried to do with haggard hawks is only use words and only talk about words that have like a really traceable past and that mm-hmm. come from responsibly written dictionaries and i'm starting to see lots of it's the kind of uber facts thing of the, the people are sharing words and i'm like don't, don't talk that. it's not really strictly speaking a word that's just, it's only ever existed on the internet. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And that's always the sort of stuff that I steer clear from. It's one of the reasons why I did this. Is people used to buy me like for Christmas presents, like books that were like a thousand and one funny words. And they <laughs> they only ever have existed in books that have titles like that. Like they've never, they don't have any, <laughs> they don't have any independent record. <laughs> they've just been sort of passed around from one to the other <laughs> for years yeah. and years and years. I noticed this just this week, actually. I was, what was I looking for? What was the word? Oh, the, I, I wanted to subtweet a certain new Twitter owner. I wanted a word <laughs> that meant like really thin-skinned and unable to take ridicule and so I kind of went searching for one and 
I found this word rectopathic, which is defined in a book that I've got here, which is one of these thousand and one funny word kind of things as overly sensitive to criticism or overly sensitive to ridicule or something. And I thought rectopathic, like that's, that's not what that would mean. I can't kind of figure out what that is. So I, I got my detective hat on and went sort of searching. And there was a book published in the 50s, I think, in America that listed this book. And that was the earliest thing that I could find it. And that said rectopathic, this is what this means. And it was one of these, you know, 2,000 words you never knew kind of mm. thing. Right. And I'm absolutely convinced that the person who compiled that book made that word up. Right. Absolutely convinced of it. And I yeah, think they were it... probably trying to be witty because rectopathy is the uh, field of medicine that deals with back passages, Your rear end. Say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they've maybe tried to be a bit witty and go, you know, they're very, yeah, very sensitive. There's a connection there. <laughs> so I think they've maybe kind of made that up. And then that word's just been passed around through all of these books right. and it's never really been used and it's never existed anywhere else. And mm -hmm. I'm seeing words like that now crop up on Twitter and on certain kind of feeds and things. And I'm like, no, that's mm -hmm. not, that's not a proper word. You're doing language wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it's a little bit like the version, oh, there's a term for it now and I've forgotten what it is. There's this term for the, the Wikipedia problem where mm. something gets erroneously added to Wikipedia with a bad source or with no source or, mm -hmm. you know, very... Yeah. And, that, and that's not true. And then some journalist is looking something up and journalist or other authors, but obviously journalists are often, you know, try to do things really quickly and look things up and they see it on Wikipedia and they don't check the yeah. source. And then they cite it in an article. And then someone comes along and finds the article and says, oh, that's a good citation and puts that <laughs> citation into the Wikipedia mm -hmm. article. And now right. the Wikipedia article has a citation. And now the next journalist who comes along will look at the thing and maybe they will check the sources. And they'll like, oh, no, no, it was in the New York Times. Okay, well, fine. And now that's, and it's now like, it's unremovable. That will yeah. never be removable ever again. Yeah. That's a, a new thing that exists. And there's a term for it that I was listening to a podcast of course because everything in my life comes from podcasts but uh, where they, there was a particular term for it and i can't remember what it was and that's what you're talking about though i i think yeah. it has existed wikipedia has obviously exacerbated that problem but it's existed oh, before absolutely. i mean yeah. it comes out of i like it's it happens in scholarship too there's what you know of the fact one of the favorite ones is the idea that carthage was salted by the romans right that they mm. plowed it under and salted it mm -hmm. was made up somehow god only knows why by an author in an early edition of the cambridge ancient history mm -hmm. in the late 1800s and it you know now it was in a very reputable source and it has been cited for a hundred and however many yeah. years it's not true that's the first time it's mentioned it's nonsense the romans wouldn't yeah. have used how much salt would that was yeah. so expensive <laughs> if you think about it for a minute oh you realize goodness. it's not physically yeah. possible but that was the and, first and, like, thing in my head really i was like <laughs> Salt is really expensive in the ancient world. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and, and they were resettling Carthage a hundred years later. Wait, it's it's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. But it's it's been cited so much by people who have been in good faith using historical sources that it's yeah. you can debunk it as many times as you want. It's never going to mm -hmm. vanish because yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's become a figure of speech, right? Well, and that too, but you know, it's just we'll never <laughs> be able to dig that out. And I think these yeah. word lists and it's like like the terms for group names for animals, right? Yeah, there's a bunch that are definitely real ones that get used, and then there's a yeah. big number of ones that are only ever found in lists of group names <laughs> for animals. <laughs> well, it's sort of yeah. nice to know that people were writing those, you know, one thousand <laughs> words you've never heard of books like back in the 13th century so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean what is isanor of, uh, of seville name checked in your book if yeah. not somebody who wrote exactly <laughs> two thousand yeah. words you never knew the origins of <laughs> exactly that yeah there's been, there's and, been people doing and once this they were written time. there <laughs> and, and, those, and his stories that he told there are still circulating yeah <laughs> so exactly <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point uh, yeah yeah of course uh, yeah this is a lot older than it's <laughs> a lot older than the 2020s that's for sure <laughs> but i agree with you that it you know that the proliferation makes it that much harder to mm -hmm. do anything about you know yeah, once, yeah. once it's once it's circulating in so many different ways absolutely <laughs> i think it's that thing of yeah you can't put the genie back in the lamp it's like that sort yeah. of 
once the story's out there and it's on a blog and it's on a website and then it's on a Twitter feed, then it, it you can't, there's no debunking that you can do that's going to cancel exactly. that out <laughs> at any point. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like ghost words, I mm-hmm. guess, how we talk about yeah. dictionaries. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the famous example of Dord. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The or D. D. Yeah. <laughs> it's got misread as yeah. Dord and it's in there it's now. Almost, <laughs> it's almost the equivalent of Dord now being used to actually mean density in scientific literature. Yeah, yeah as if they of, picked it up. Yeah, <laughs> they've actually kind of taken it on. Yeah, I'm sure that, that there is an example of that happening. I'm trying to remember what it is. Oh, it's, it's a, yeah, it's the group terms thing. Baboons is a troop ordinarily. But there was mm-hmm. a comedy sketch over here in the 80s on a show called Not the Nine O'Clock News, which had Ron mm-hmm. Atkinson in it. And he used in one of these sketches, he, he said it was a, a troop of baboons or as it's known, a, a flange. And now <laughs> primatologists use the term a flange of baboons. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of those things that's sort of taken the extra yeah. step. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's merely entertaining. <laughs> yeah. I, don't think, I don't think it yeah. ruins our scientific understanding of the that's world. That's true, yeah. <laughs> and it's got a good uh, etymological story behind it as well, if you can yeah. trace it back. And one that you can actually, yeah, if you can trace yeah. it to the exact <laughs> moment. <laughs> Have you ever been tempted to like a trap street thing, put in a fake word somewhere and just see if anyone? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, actually, I, there's one in in the book, Haggard Hawks. There's a word in there that I just made up. Absolutely. <laughs> but, and I, I'm just waiting for it to turn up on one of these, <laughs> on one of these, <laughs> or in another book or on one of these Twitter accounts. I think as well, years ago, I might have put one up on the blog and I'm just waiting. For, I'm, but now, see, this is my problem. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I remember the one from Haggard Hawks. I can still remember that because I, in the explanation of where this word comes from, I name check some of my mates. <laughs> I'd like make out that they're like 18th century dictionary writers or something, and it's not. It's just it was, it was my housemate at the time. <laughs> so I've always I've always remembered that one in Haggard Hawks. So yeah, there's a little trap in that one. I'm trying to think what the one on the blog was now. I'm really annoyed that I can't remember what it is. I have done the same thing. I love I love credited one of my mates with taking it up but <laughs> said that they were a sort of 16th century dictionary writer or something <laughs> yeah it'll be on there somewhere so, so yeah I've, I've done a couple of a couple of little copyright traps if i ever spot one of them i'm gonna yeah that'll be that'll be a red letter day, definitely <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting well, how it's mm-hmm. changed I'm, I'm thinking yeah i'm thinking about how it has changed online on twitter over the last few years and mm-hmm. it, it's almost like the bar's been kind of lifted in some respects and people are a lot smarter but also mm-hmm. there's a lot more there's a lot more of that stuff there's a lot more of that hundred funny words thing going around mm-hmm. now as well mm-hmm. yeah. there's a lot of people who want to do that at sharing of information but aren't necessarily and I, this makes, I don't, I don't want this to sound like I'm, you know, gatekeeping, but hmm. it is, language is perpetually fun and interesting. And there's a lot of that sort of, Ooh, I think I'm going to talk about these interesting things. And if you, if you come at that with, from that perspective mm-hmm. and don't know how to differentiate your sources particularly well, for instance, then hmm. it's very easy to replicate those, those issues. Yeah. And then there are some out there that are just, I mean, parallel issue is there's a whole bunch of Twitter feeds that are about the ancient world that put up pictures of ancient art or pictures of ancient scat- statues or ancient uh-huh. facts. And, you know, some of them are run by enthusiastic amateurs who sometimes get stuff right and sometimes get stuff wrong. And that's one yeah. thing. But there's also a bunch that are run quite cynically by people who just want the clicks mm-hmm. yeah, and absolutely. they have no clearly no concern at all about because when people tell them that's utter you know that's completely not true uh-huh. it does you know they'll run it again the next week they don't care yeah. and and those you know so there is and i think that's true in language too there are you know there's a subset there's people who maybe don't know where to get their best information but then there are also some that are by people who have no interest in the subject and are just using it because it's something that gets them clicks on Twitter. Yeah. And those ones, I think, are the egregious ones where you do see a lot of those common myths and because, you know, they're the fun stories or they're the mm-hmm. best, yeah. uh, most attention grabbing or controversial or whatever. Well, it's like yeah. that that Ishtar Easter one that crop, yeah. keeps cropping up again and again. Mm-hmm. I wonder who started that. <laughs> and because it's way better as a story then Mm -hmm. well we're not totally certain Mm -hmm. yeah and this is where the etymology stuff comes in the Uh folk etymologies are often much more fun than the (laughs) well i don't know dog 
probably comes from kelps. We don't know where dog comes from. Yeah, like <laughs> it's not a great, <laughs> it's not a great story, but making something up. You know. Yeah, and I think as well those kind of like you say those kind of quite cynical accounts tend to be they'll just copy and paste. Yeah. from mm-hmm. yeah. each other and and from other accounts and other websites and things that maybe aren't sort of like you say as responsible with the information so yeah mm-hmm. there's a lot of that kind of reinforcing the same stuff going on. Yeah, yeah yeah it's interesting i i there was one of these accounts i won't name it but they went through a phase of everything that i put on haggard Hawks would turn up on there a couple like about three four days later i remember this mm-hmm. i also won't yeah. name it but i remember and i had an, an email from them and they said no this it's just a coincidence it's not happening and then me being me i posted something on haggard horse that had a really glaring typo in it and then it turned up on that account a few days later with the same typo in it oh no <laughs> i was like oh okay so yeah that email wasn't true <laughs> yeah but yeah it, it's interesting that everything kind of just gets sort of passed around sometimes not in the most sort of responsible way well you know what would be neat is a, a book about wrong etymologies like all the oh, etymologies yeah. in it are ones that are incorrect folk etymologies Pop- and stuff. Popular but untrue, basically, yeah. is the, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a really good idea. Mark, you've got to write that. <laughs> <laughs> Do I see a collab in the future here? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, there's so many. I, if I see Posh explains his port out star at home one more time, I might, <laughs> Yeah, I yeah there'd be a whole throw, chapter yeah. that was just... <laughs> that was just false acronyms. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And initialisms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's um, so many. I'm sure people, there are people who compile them, but yeah, one could, one could compile a list pretty fast, mm. I think. Yeah. yeah, definitely. You just need to read one of those other Twitter accounts. <laughs> 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 just copy and paste again. <laughs> But this time, with a whole paragraph underneath explaining what's wrong and what's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it would, yeah, what would be what called, well, wrong. actually. Yeah. <laughs> what would be called, yeah. well, well, actually. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> you know, false etymologies and why they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a great idea. Def- Mark, you've definitely got to write that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. The, the next be fun. The next yeah. six videos are just going to be you starting off with, well, actually. <laughs> Here's why everything you thought was right is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> That's a TikTok genre if I, I've ever heard one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> well, we could just keep chatting forever because this is very nice to catch up and to chat, but I have a, a one burning question with which I wish to end this mm-hmm. you know not i don't want to end the conversation but since <laughs> by all logic we do need to end it at some point <laughs> here's the question that i i need to know the answer to it's very mm-hmm. serious and very important will there be more episodes of yes or bs <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah there will be <laughs> Yay! Yay! I, was, I wasn't expecting that at all. I was really braced for something there. I know. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. They, they, actually, you know, if I hadn't taken this book on, there would have been a lot Three more. Three seasons, probably. yeah. Yeah. And yeah, this book ended up being so massive and mm-hmm. Ant has I changed that. jobs and now works a lot down in Manchester. So it, it's kind of when I finished this, he changed his work schedule. So it's, like, <laughs> uh, it's just, yeah, it's been on the back burner for ages. And every time we meet up, every single time, because I still see him every few weeks. Um, mm-hmm. oh, have we, we'll, we'll do some more. I've got some great ideas. We'll do some more. We'll do a Christmas one. We'll do this. Even if we just do a one-off, we'll like we'll, we'll do it. We'll get all the equipment back out <laughs> around yours. Because he's a voiceover artist, so he's, so he's mm-hmm. got all the, mm-hmm. all the kit around his. And then something will come up and he'll be away and I'll not be able to do it. And, <laughs> and Or I'll have some sort of book business coming up. So, yeah, it, it and it's just rolled on and it's rolled on and it's rolled on. I, there will be, definitely. This is the problem, though, is that last time we were out, it was me and, and another one of my mates, Gav, who anyone who follows me mm-hmm. personally on Twitter will know that Gav is <laughs> it's one of my best mates and his entire mm-hmm. sense of humour is based around taking the mickey out of me constantly that's the only <laughs> joke that he has and last time we were out anthony was like well why why don't you do it with gav 
And I can see me and Gav trying to do this, and it's just it it'll just end up as like a rinsing competition. It'll just be him, <laughs> just uh, ever bringing me down ever more pegs <laughs> every single week. <laughs> so yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe not with Gav, but <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll run this by Ant again when I see him. I'm sure I'm. Well, I'll, tell I'll, him that I'll there's a clamorous soon. public. Yeah. A clamorous <laughs> public requesting more. If anyone hasn't listened to the back catalog of Yes or BS podcast, yes. If you if you haven't heard of this podcast before, you you've got you know a real treat yes. awaiting you. Uh, exactly. This is it's the funniest podcast out there, <laughs> and it's one that I always have to make sure I don't listen to when I'm out in public because I will just suddenly burst out with maniacal laughter. <laughs> It's odd because, like, I mean, it's been a while since we've done one, but it, it, every time we go out, Anthony is still annoyed about Mozart having a pet Stalin. And <laughs> this comes up all the time. He'll go, I can't believe you got me with that Stalin fact. It, it comes up all the time. It's still a so point. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's it's been a while but it's still there in the background every time every time we meet up so uh, yeah i, I will I, i'm sure well anthony will probably listen to this to be fair yeah i'll i'll yeah we'll we'll definitely get it sorted and we'll definitely do some more i think it's when when our <laughs> when our paths align oh i mean again. we are the last people to to hold anyone to any kind of fixed schedule because we are <laughs> terrible at doing the very many things we want to do in any kind of timely fashion so you know please don't take it as a criticism merely as our enthusiastic yeah support. i mean we i'm so glad that people enjoyed it and like yeah it's great hearing that people are still listening to it and still laughing at it and stuff because we <laughs> absolutely loved doing it it was so mm. much fun yeah yeah, it's it's just it's honestly just been scheduling for like the oh, last. Oh, I understand that. Goodness yeah. knows how many years. Yeah, two years or something now. But yeah, mm. it, it, there will be. I'm sure of it because we've both got a list of facts still that we need to. Yeah, do. and you. I've, yeah, you I've each of you them. hold. A, I'm sure have grudges you are holding against the other that absolutely. you need to pay off. So yeah, you know. absolutely. I'm still mad about that ghost ship fact. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm raging about that. And what to see? This is the other thing as well is that when we recorded that. And went off on like a 15 minute diatribe about the history of the coal industry and how <laughs> collier ships, <laughs> what the collier route across the Atlantic was and all this. And I was sat there thinking, this isn't interesting. None of this is interesting. Even people who are interested in coal ships aren't going to find this interesting. <laughs> And and uh, when he sent me the file across, he edited it all out. <laughs> and I was like, I had to sit through this. <laughs> so that's still a sore point. I still need to get him back for his list of Collier facts. Definitely. <laughs> Well, now you'll you'll be able to test him on whether he's read your book or not because you can give him facts about like the Bernoulli yeah. effect in your mouth and things like that's that. That's true. And see, yeah. <laughs> see if he and catches that is, you. Oh, yeah, that's true. Spider alert: He won't have read it. A hundred percent. There you go. So now you've got a whole a whole field of surprising facts that you know in <laughs> yeah. science, no less. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll be like, well, actually, you know, if you'd know this if you'd read my book. That's, that's really good. Yeah, I might drop that in. <laughs> Especially if it is something that's not in your book. That would yeah. be particularly cool. <laughs> yeah, set a real trap for him. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, of course. I read that. I remember it. It's true. Mm -hmm. He's just sour because he, he didn't end up in the acknowledgements. This is the thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I should have put him in. Yeah. I put Gavin, and all it says is Gavin Howard for no reason. I just I thought it would be funny just to, just to put his name in print for us. <laughs> well, this has been an absolute delight. Yes. And as I said, we'd be perfectly happy to just spend the rest of the afternoon chatting. Yeah. But we should be responsible people <laughs> and not probably so let me ask you to go over the many and multifarious ways people can access your information and knowledge and wit on the internet and in person where okay. can you be found yeah well <laughs> haggardhawks.com is kind of the hub i guess the haggardhawks website and that'll link you to haggardhawks on twitter plus me on twitter paul anth jones which is a terrible handle because everyone always gets it wrong. <laughs> yes, it's got an H in the middle of it. So yeah, you can track me down there or paulantijones.com for me, but I haven't updated that website for donkeys, so maybe don't go there. Haggard Hoax, <laughs> just head for Haggard Hoax. You'll be fine. Everything's up right. there. <laughs> and the new book is called? Why is this a question? And I, yeah, I think, <laughs> is, it, is it out in Canada now? I don't know. 
I I don't think so. I should check. I I think it might be on its way, but I think maybe it's next year. All right. Well, so thank you so much. And it was a delight. Yeah. And the book is a delight. Oh, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) And everyone should go out and buy it to support more of the Mm -hmm. same. (laughs) (laughs) So that in six more years, we can talk to you about something else (laughs) (laughs) yeah why is this also a question (laughs) (laughs) why is this still a question is actually what the second one should be (laughs) yeah i'm writing that down right now (laughs) (laughs) it's all yours (laughs) all right well we'll hopefully talk to you on twitter or some other site soon (laughs) yeah definitely oh thank you so much guys honestly i've loved that oh it's great bye-bye bye bye For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.